passion Love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of the Savior The hope of nations Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to say He is mighty to say Forever Author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave So take me as you find me All my fears and failures Fill my life again Give my life to follow Everything I believe in
it's about over. <laughs> yeah. Good morning. Shall we get gathered up and help the Flora family uh, sing and whatever else and praise and uh, okay, help us out here a little bit, please. Thank you. Maybe I'm the one that needs the help. <laughs> but I've always known that. <laughs> Thank you, Floors and Donna. He did set us free, didn't he? Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you that you set us free by all your promises and the love that you've shown us. Thank you so much for your grace, your understanding, just taking care of us in our lives. We just see it every day. Thank you, Jesus, for life itself in your precious name. Amen. You can be seated if you like. We'll go through the birthdays and anniversaries. Kathy Denby has a birthday today. Happy birthday, Kathy. <laughs> and Ozzie has a birthday the 30th, which I guess is Tuesday, the way I see it. And talking about Ozzie's birthday in the bulletin you see we need to wish Ozzy a happy birthday and we've already wished Kathy a happy birthday but we can uh, share a cake in the back for both of them it's got Ozzy's name on it but we'll sh we'll share a cake in the back after church for uh, for these birthdays okay and there's one omission that we've had and probably didn't have it in our books, but John and Jeannie Goshen had an anniversary January 23rd. So happy anniversary, John. I see you there. Okay. Uh, let's see. What else we got? We got a lot of stuff here. Contribution statements are back on the table in uh, envelopes right there that uh, has been prepared for you from last year's contribution so please pick them up and uh, see there's quite a few left there I don't know whether there have been people here that haven't been here or what but anyway look through that and get your contribution statement I think uh, oh here we go here's another and I knew I had another one. okay 
We are going to vote on trustees next week. We have two nominations for trustee, and by our bylaws and by state laws and et cetera, we need to vote on those as a congregation. And the nominees are Dean Flora and Tom Quine. So next week we will vote on those. So anybody else have anything else? I don't, I don't see anything else here. So uh, okay, we'll continue on. Thank you. Galatians 6 9 reads, And let us not get tired of doing what is right. For after a while, we will reap a harvest of blessings if we do not get discouraged and give up. Have you ever done anything over and over again? that it becomes so routine that it becomes boring, tiresome, unexciting, and sometimes you completely forget why you're doing it. I knew a minister one time back years ago that had memorized Psalms 118.24 for the opening of his worship service. The psalm reads like this. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. He had used this verse every week for many, many years and for countless numbers of, number of services. He knew this verse as well as he knew his own name. Then one Sunday, he went to open his service and suddenly his mind went blank. He couldn't even remember the first word. Embarrassed, he opened his Bible and read it the lines aloud. Later that day, he began to wonder what went wrong. He had opened his service the same verse maybe 5,000 times. How could he suddenly forget it? As he thought about it, he realized that after using the same verse over and over, he had lost all motivation for saying it. It had become just words with no meaning. And his mind rebelled 
and refused to let him even remember the first word. Doing the same thing over and over again does not have to get boring. Or it can stay interesting and exciting, depending upon our motivation for doing it. Some people think that having the Lord's Supper every week gets tiresome. However, it doesn't have to be. We do things every day over and over again that we do not consider boring, unexciting, or tiresome because we are motivated to do them. For example, as Americans, we eat about six times a day, including snacks. Now, I know that's right because I got it from the internet. <laughs> but we seldom get tired of food. I know, for example, that Sharon Fry never gets tired of french fries. We fight over them. We drive our car just about every day. But we're always eager to go somewhere. I know that Leon and Betty are ready to go on a minute's notice. It's not reputation, and not repetition, repetition, I get that out right, alone that makes something boring. But it's our failure not to not remember our motivation for not doing it. If the Lord's Supper has become boring, repetitive, become a boring, repetitive ritual in which we have lost our motivation for doing it, perhaps we need to go back and read the stories of the early Christians and their motivation for taking communion, sometimes in secret, or the intriguing story of the life of Christ especially the Last Supper and the Resurrection. If communion has become tiresome, perhaps it might help if we go to bed a little bit earlier on Saturday night. And yeah, we can come down here refreshed and ready to concentrate on the ceremony. If the Lord's Supper has become unexciting, perhaps you need to remember the accounts of the Last Supper and the dark, tangled web of our sins that were forgiven when Jesus took them away, when he stretched out his hands on that cross. Jesus understood that with the right motivation, there was nothing boring, tiresome, or unexciting about the Lord's Supper. So as we take communion this morning in remembrance of Jesus Christ, let us prove him right. There is nothing boring, tiresome, or unexciting about salvation. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, the eternal God, we gather this morning as grain went scattered and now as one loaf to come together to remember the sacrifice 
of your Son who saved us from our sins. Help us to keep this sacrifice forever in our hearts so that communion does not become boring, tiresome, and unexciting ritual, but rather an exciting sacrament in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I cannot 
Well, good morning, everybody. And welcome to Christ Church of the Valley as we continue our series through the Bible, The Big Picture. Somebody shared with me last week, I didn't go into all the details of uh, the David-Goliath battle, but somebody shared with me they had ever heard, they had ever thought, David goes to the stream and he picks up five boulders or, or little rocks or, you know, about the size of a tennis ball thereabouts. And why did he pick up five? Well, the text doesn't tell us. The text tells us he absolutely trusted that God had given him the victory, but perhaps he didn't trust his own aim. And so, although trusting in God, he wasn't overly trusting in himself. Maybe. I don't know. Um, that is an example of a, I, I like whoever came up with that interpretation. That's a maybe good interpretation. I'm going to share with you this morning a, a little bit of an embarrassing interpretation that I've ever tried to do to scripture. Um, whenever you do something new, you mess up. That's how you learn. Thank you for whoever that was. <laughs> Uh, th th this, um, I was very, very young in Christ. I was very new in reading the Bible and trying to understand what it meant and what it was saying to us and what we should do with it. With it. Flip over with me to Acts chapter 13. And this is Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey. They've been sent out as missionaries of the church to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And they've taken along John Mark with them. And let's pick it up. This is uh, chapter 13, verse 5, and we'll go to verse 14. When they reached Samos, and they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, they also had John, that's John Mark, as their helper. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, or a magi. This is the same word in Matthew. The magi, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus, which means son of Jesus, not Jesus Christ, obviously, um, who had attached himself to uh, the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. The man, Sergius Paulus, uh, summoned... Barnabas and Saul, to, and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who is also known as Paul, fixed, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze upon him and said, You who are full of deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. So here's... Paul and Barnabas, and they're dealing with somebody who's opposing them, who's working against them. And when I was a young Christian, and uh, there were people opposing me, picking on me, giving me a hard time, I read this story and I thought, well, maybe this is, uh, you can use the Holy Spirit to get them. No. That's not, the, that's not the meaning of this passage, now is it? And uh, I'm, uh, may I say I'm happy that it didn't work because I have no idea how to reverse it. <laughs> uh, but to this, we read a passage in the scriptures and what do we do? How do we interpret? Can I get the picture up here, please? I want to give you two terms. One is exegesis. Yes, it sounds like Jesus is in that word exegesis, but as you can see, no, it's not Jesus. Exegesis. Exegesis is where the text leads to understanding. That is, here is the scriptures, and this fellow is trying to get 
from the word its meaning. Asking, what are you saying to me, word of God? And over here, experiential. Here, this fellow, he is taking his experiences and he's applying it to the scriptures. So he is telling the scriptures what they mean. Now, of these two, one is highly subjective and one is highly objective. And may I suggest that the right way is to ask scripture, what do you tell me? The author of scripture sat down, whichever book we're in, whoever we're talking about, they sat down and they wrote. And they wrote with a message hoping to communicate it to everybody else not hoping that they would take their experiences and interpret their words. I hope that makes sense. This morning, as I previewed last week, we have to look at a passage that has been severely misused as of late, and I want to address what, what is it saying, what does it mean. So flip over with me to 1 Samuel chapter 18. This is immediately following David and Goliath and David's victory and so forth. Uh, chapter 18, verse 1 through 5. Now it came about that when he had finished speaking to Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. Verse 2. Saul took him, uh, David, that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sew, sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. And Saul sent, set him over the men of war, and this was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now, in the past, as we've been working our way through various stories and parts of Scripture, I have pointed out if the Scripture is using some sort of double talk, some sort of uh, induendo or anything like that, I can assure you that in the Hebrew, there is no innuendo in these verses. This language is not sexual in nature. And that's why it's not translated as such. Uh, people have ever looked at this. He made a covenant. His soul was knit to him. He loved him as he loved himself. And they've come to very modern, radical interpretations of these passages and they have applied meaning to these words that the ancient Hebrew did not communicate. An ancient Hebrew reader would not have read this and wondered if there's something going on between these two. But there is a reference in here, a Torah reference, a reference to the scriptures. Verse 5 says that uh, uh, everything David does, pro he prospers. This is a very rare word, and you'll only find it in Deuteronomy, saying that whoever commits and does the will of God, or obeys the commandments of God, he will prosper. And I suggested to you last week, and I continue to suggest to you, the author of 1 Samuel is intimately familiar with the Pentateuch, or the Torah, Deuteronomy in particular. And I don't find this an accident. That he is saying of David here, he prospers. Why does he prosper? Because he keeps the commandments of God. Now, I would suggest to you that that should end this discussion. But we do have to deal with one more passage. I was sharing with a church member over the week that... Can I say I feel... I feel a little bit bad for Jonathan in that Jonathan is such a powerful character both in the Saul narratives and in the David narrative and yet he's only ever a secondary character. 
He's never the one on center stage. He's always the one with somebody on stage. And we see in Jonathan a very godly, wonderful fighter for Israel. I skipped this story. Jonathan, earlier in our narrative, he displayed this great uh, display of faith as he attacked the Philistines. And he said to his armor bearer, if this, then God has given them into our hands. And if that, God has not given them, the Philistines into our hands. He is expressing strong faith, belief that God is actually in control of the battle and he, God, decides the outcome. Jonathan is a warrior. Jonathan trusts in the Lord. He trusts that the Lord is God over all things. And he has to protect David at the risk of his father. He has to protect David, who he loves, from Saul. Saul tries to kill him on several occasions. Unfortunately, the life of Jonathan is ended at the same time as the life of his father. They both die at the hands of the Philistines. And when David hears about this, David writes a lament. He writes a poem, and he wants it taught to all of Israel. And even though Saul has tried to kill him, he still laments the death of Saul. It's so beautiful. You, I, I just want to remind you that, that this is the David who had opportunity to kill Saul and would not raise his hand against the Lord's anointed. And when he finally dies, Saul, or David writes this epic poem about how Israel needs to remember. Needs to remember all that Saul did, at least in the positive. Now here he writes, some, David writes something, and if David were alive today, I would tell David, maybe you should pick some different words here. David, you don't understand that one day pastors and Bible scholars and preachers with a middle school mentality will read this and twist your words. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, verses 25 through 26. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. Jonathan is slain on your high places. Verse 26, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love was more wonderful than the love of women. And people have seized this with a sophomoric humor and suggested that David was a switch hitter, if you follow. And what they failed to take into account is the ancient Near East and the customs of the ancient Near East. Some of them are still displayed today. There are various parts of the Near East you could go to today. And unlike our setting, where men and women can sit right next to each other, they are kept separate. Men on this side, women on this side. I'll remind you that in Jesus' day in the synagogue, the men sat downstairs, and if there was an upper floor, that's where the women sat, or they sat outside the door. Men and women distinct and separate. And when you went to the temple, remember that the inner court, or excuse me, the court, the first court, not the inner sanctuary. <laughs> I almost misspoke there. The court was the court of the men of Israel. And the women had to stay out in the court of the women and of the Gentiles. And this was just the way the Middle East, believe me, if they were here today, they would think we're crazy because men and women are sitting at the same table. David and Jonathan are in a culture and in a time and in a society and they're in the military. They will form lasting bonds with other men and may I look at David's marriages. David was married seven times. At this point, only six of his wives are with him because Michael is back home in Jerusalem. And let's just look at his marriages. He doesn't exactly get married to form lifelong bonds with these women. 
Some of the women mentioned as his wives are actually political allies. By forming a political marriage, you have the family support with you. But whether or not they regularly had dinner together, I seriously doubt. Whereas in the military, and in the sense that Jonathan is a fighter with him, right alongside with him, he had formed this bond with Jonathan that is that is well people who have served in the military did you form lasting bonds with people you served with and may I again point out that they both live under a code of God that forbid same sex coupling same sex situations the author of first second samuel has no problem pointing out david's sins especially his sexual sins do you think that the author who's going to point those out is going to cover for david and use some sort of code language that you're supposed to only understand today no that's just foolishness so David, uh, Saul and Jonathan die at the hands of the Philistines. David becomes king. And here is where I hate being the preacher. And I love being the teacher. Because what we should do is we should stay here for the next four hours and go through every detail in the text. Because there's so much to, to go through right here. There's a little bit of a conflict and war between what's left of the house of Saul and David. And there's a little bit of civil war between Benjamin and, and, and so forth. But we have to uh, get to... Uh, David has become king and eventually everybody accepts that he's the new king. He has wars against the various factions against Israel and he's able to defeat them and he's able to usher in peace and when the Lord is on your side and you're able to offer peace that's going to bring people to your side pretty quickly so again we see the hand of God blessing everything that David does David brings the ark from where we last saw it when the Philistines had captured it and they had to send it back to, to, to Israel and it stayed in the, in the field and David brings it back to Jerusalem and David has peace and he's built himself a nice mansion of cedar wood and one day he looks out and he says the ark of God resides in a tent and here I am living in this nice mansion and he sets about, to, he sets about to, to say to Nathan the prophet, I am going to build a house for the Lord. And Nathan the prophet says, The Lord is with you. Do everything in your heart or do everything in your mind. Do you guys remember this story? Because that night, Nathan goes home and the Lord speaks to him. And Nathan now has to go back and tell David, I misspoke. That's why on the first Wednesdays of the month when we have men's coffee and I open it up to questions and uh, Bible questions and theology questions and whatnot, I really like you to email them to me beforehand so that especially an, an obscure passage of scripture, I have time to at least read it before I try to answer it. Or a theology question, I have time to read. Okay, so here, I'll be honest with you. I forget half of what I ever decided I believe on that issue. <laughs> And I forget why I, I chose that side over that side. And I have to go back and I have to look at my notes and remember whatever convinced me that A and not B. So it's always good to, to check the word of God before you try to speak the word of God. Make sense? Um, the Lord speaks to the prophet Nathan. And Nathan has to tell David that I misspoke. You don't get to build the house of God. But... Through Nathan, God speaks to David, and he gives what's often called the Davaic covenant. We, we've already been through a couple covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the Noahic covenant, the Old Covenant, and here we find the Davaic covenant. You might also, in various texts, find it the King Covenant, 
whichever, it's all the same. But here, God is speaking through the prophet Nathan to David. Let's pick it up in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through, 12 through 16. He says, When your days are completed and you lie down with your father, fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne, the throne of his kingdom, forever. I will be his father, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and with the strokes of the son of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Who is God referring to as he speaks to David? Solomon? Maybe? A little bit? Somewhat? Here we run into one of those interesting Bible prophecies from the mouth of God. Some of these fit very well with Solomon, and yet some of them don't fit very well with Solomon. And what do we do with that? For example, um, he shall build a house for my name, and Solomon builds the first temple, right? And I will establish his throne and his kingdom forever. Well, not so much, seeing how pretty quick after Solomon dies, the kingdom is divided into two, and there's the northern kingdom and there's the southern kingdom. That's, that doesn't fit this perfectly, does it? And then eventually, the southern kingdom, the line of David, it has some pretenders along the way, and eventually, the Babylonian captivity, and since the Babylonian captivity, the house of David has not ruled. Hmm. So... Did the word of God fail? Now, interestingly, there is another one of those play on words here in the passage. Flip over with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is Peter preaching at Pentecost. And Peter is answering... He's telling the people that the Messiah has come and he has died. But not only did he die, he also was raised from the dead. He quotes David. And then picking it up in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse uh, 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to, uh, sworn, sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Verse 32, this Jesus God raised up again, which we are all witnesses of. You see that God raised up. You flip back to uh, 2 Samuel and you see that uh, God says that I will raise up one of your descendants. And we see this double meaning in the text. The idea that he will uh, ascend to the throne. He will be raised up. But Peter sees in this a reference to the resurrection. That he would be raised up. Speaking of this, there's this, um, this, this other double meaning that you and I, we have a trouble seeing it because our brains are so programmed. I say the word, the Son of God, to you. And what do you immediately think of with the Son of God? The second person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
Interestingly here, verse 14, I will be his father and he will be a son to me. I love this because here comes the professor out of me again, just, just be warned, that uh, people have ever criticized Matthew, Mark, and Luke for calling Jesus the Son of God, and they've said that these, these are documents written at least a generation after the life of Jesus, and uh, they're giving Jesus these, these like Christian terms that were developed long after. Interestingly, I've told you about the Dead Sea Scrolls. The, uh, they were found in those caves uh, near the Dead Sea by the Qumran community. And in the in the scrolls, we found all of the books of the Old Testament with the exception of Esther, but we also found the, that group's writings, their sectarian writings. That group was reading this passage and saying that there will one day come a son of God who will be the Messiah. There's another set of writings. It's called the Psalms of Solomon. It's not the two Psalms in the book of Psalms attributed to, to Solomon. This is a book, it's compiled probably around 300, 200 BC. It's probably Pharisaic in nature. That is to say, it was probably a Pharisee that ever wrote it. And he was predicting the Messiah based on his reading of Solomon. And he also lifted this very passage to say that when the Messiah comes, he would be the son of God in some way, in some form or fashion. So here we have Jews of the Second Temple period within about 100 years of Jesus before the writings of the New Testament already saying that they were believing Messiah would somehow be the Son of God. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when they're using this term, they're not inventing something. They're not pulling something out of the air that wasn't already in Second Temple Judaism at this time. I want to take you back to the baptism of Jesus by John. And when he comes out of the water, the Spirit comes down upon him as a dove, and a voice is heard from heaven. What does the voice say? This is my Son. With him I am well pleased. Or, this is the Son I delight in. There's still this king issue, though, because his throne is going to be established forever, and he's going to build a house for him. And we see a little bit of play on words here in the text, because it's David that wants to build a house for God, and God is saying that this one is going to build the house for me, and I'm going to build your house. Is God not without irony? that he keeps using these double meanings. People have tried to interpret Jesus. They've tried to figure out who this Jesus was and what he was doing. How do we interpret Jesus? How do we understand him? He was a good man. He was a good teacher. He was a revolutionary set to change the world. He was a radical. He was an anti-establishment. He had a new perspective on God and a new perspective on humanity. He was a proto-feminist. He was a proto-Marxist. He was a proto-progressive. Now, unfortunately, all of those are out there. We already mentioned the internet earlier. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke all begin the Jesus ministry with John the baptizer. And John the baptizer says to the people, repent for the kingdom is near. The kingdom is coming. Jesus, after he's baptized, he is tempted by the devil. And when he comes back and he starts to interact with people after this victory, what does he start to say? He starts to say, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, or is near, or is in your midst. 
the kingdom of God. He tells his Sermon on the Mount, he tells people, the poor in spirit will inherit the kingdom of God. He warns his very own followers that if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. He teaches his followers to pray, saying, Father, your kingdom come. He tells people not to worry about what they'll eat or what they'll drink, but to seek first the kingdom of God. He tells his 12 disciples that they will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel in his kingdom. In Mark chapter 15, Pilate asks Jesus, Are you a king? And Jesus says, It is as you say. In John chapter 18, Jesus fleshes this out a little bit more. And the Greek is fascinating at this point. Again, we translate it that Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. But we can also translate it, my kingdom is not from this world. Meaning, my kingdom is coming into this world. In the revelation of Jesus Christ, he has a name on his thigh. He is the king of kings. Kings. And this is just a small survey of the numerous king kingdom passages of the New Testament of understanding who this Jesus is. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not giving you random details and telling you put the pieces together however you see fit. They're communicating Jesus through the Old Testament. And where Solomon did partially fulfill this promise to David, partially fulfilled, he did build the first temple. He did, and it's not a fake temple. It's not a false religious system. In fact, the glory of the Lord comes into that temple in such a beautiful way. But his kingdom ended, and that building ended. This passage is only partially fulfilled in Solomon. It finds its ultimate, complete fulfillment in Jesus, who came to build the Father's house. Did he build the Father's house? And did he establish it? And has it existed from that day forward? Well, you guys are sitting here, a part of the building that Jesus built, the house of God. We encounter in this beautiful prophecy given to David glimpses of the power and ability of God. You might have this short view in mind. And there are fulfillments. Again, I'm not saying that it's not Solomon. I'm saying that it's not fully Solomon. And God has this fuller plan. God has this greater plan. God has an eternal plan. And you are a part of that eternal plan. That is, if you are in the building of Christ. That is, if you are in the house that Christ built, Christ established. Are you? Are you in God's family? Because there's only one way in. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And of course, my favorite verse, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Do you all have it memorized yet? I hope you do. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We were having a beautiful discussion in Sunday school this morning. Uh, There was a Roman writer, his name was Cicero, and he said of the cross... And crucifixion, it was so horrific that a Roman citizen shouldn't even say the word cross because it's so offensive, because it brings to mind such agony and vile disgust. But when you look at the cross 
I hope you see your salvation paid in full. I hope you see Jesus' words, it is finished. It's always possible there's somebody that doesn't know what it is to be in Christ. That's Paul's shorthand for Christian. Luke uses the word Christian. Why Paul never adopted it, I don't know, but he always saw it as relational. He always saw it as you're in Christ. It's always possible we'll have somebody who doesn't know what it is to be in Christ. If that's you this morning, don't leave here this morning without talking to me or talk to one of our other leaders. If you're watching online, you can call the church, you can email the church. The church, I stole this, and and I'm going to continue to steal it. In the book of the Revelation, the churches are lampstands because lampstands shine light. And Jesus is the light. And the purpose for the church is to shine the light of Jesus into this dark and hurt and broken world. I want to invite the worship team to come on back up. Christian, you're already in Christ. You have been in Christ for however long you've been in Christ. Hear God's word through the prophet Nathan here. See the beauty that is the word of God in this prophecy. Struggle with the original audience. Struggle with the audiences to come after it. Why would Jews of the Second Temple period read this passage and think there's somebody still to come who will somehow be the Son of God? Because they saw that the passage is partially fulfilled in Solomon, but not totally fulfilled in Solomon. Christian, you know the full fulfillment of this prophecy. He's in you. He's with you. Christian, we look back at this kind of a passage and we see the hand of God in ways that man can't be. We see the power of God in ways that you can't orchestrate this. You can't bring it about. How many of you have ever had a plan fall through? If this is what God can do, what can God do for you? What kind of God do you serve? And we see here one of those important links between the Old Testament and the New Testament to see the great big picture of God's story. Let's be standing, singing a hymn of invitation.
Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God of promises and fulfillments. We thank you that where David had his heart set on one thing, you had an even greater plan. Father God, again, let us have the faith of David as we move forward. Let us believe whatever we see in this world, whatever the prophet Nathan brings before us, to see your plan is greater than our plan. Lord God, we love you and praise you, and we pray for your building, the church throughout the world, that it shine the light of your gospel. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not sure what it says about me that I empathize so much with the characters of Scripture, but you're going to want to come back next week because, again, we see a beautiful character who starts so well and yet has tragedy, faith struggles, moral struggles, issues. How does it end? Well, you'll have to come back next week. Let's close it out with one final song.
now God and King His love endures forever For He is good, He is above all things His love endures forever